My friend messaged me on Discord this morning that he wants his player character in my upcoming Pathfinder 2nd Edition campaign to be a goblin barbarian. His message says, Okay, one minor backstory thing. Assuming I build my goblin barbarian for the main campaign, I'm gonna make it so he was adopted by a strip family at birth. Mostly so I can make this joke. And linked me to a TikTok. After watching the TikTok and realizing he meant Strix, a huge sigh of relief and a reminder that autocorrect is the real villain. Huh, a story with a happy and humorous resolution for all parties. If only they could all be like that. I was playing D&D &D and my DM was completely distracted the entire game. Turns out, the guy was preoccupied manually setting all his bookmarks and extensions on a new browser and just wasn't focused on the actual game. <sighs> Why didn't he just use Opera GX? Opera GX is back as the sponsor of today's video with their incredible web browser made specifically for gamers. One of the best features is their sidebar, which allows you to access your social media channels. Twitch, Discord, and using the Flow feature, Instagram, Facebook, and more are accessible right there in your sidebar. Easy to access and easy to use. If you also like customization, they also have brilliant animated wallpapers that are really, really easy to use. It allows you to do cool stuff like this. If you're concerned about the hassle of switching browsers, do not worry. Opera GX has a quick import tool to quickly put in all of your browsing history, bookmarks, and cookies, as well as compatibility with all Google Chrome extensions. If you're concerned about price, you need not be concerned at all because there is no price because Opera GX is 100% free to download. So if you guys are interested, head down into the description down below where you can pick up Opera GX on your desktop and your mobile phone so that you can take advantage of the flow feature and seamlessly transition your data from your computer to your phone easier than ever. As always, supporting our sponsors does support us. And without further ado, I'm going to turn back into an animated rat so that we can get back to the video. Had to make a second account because my DM knows my other Reddit. Sorry if this seems incoherent. I didn't think I would actually post this today, but I guess I just wanted to see if I was insane. All names used are fake, obviously. My DM, who we will call Mike, has been running D&D 5th edition games on and off with us for a few years now. His girlfriend Jenny has recently started playing with us for his latest campaign we began about half a year ago now. And though Mike has historically been a great DM, he just keeps bending the rules and generally focusing the campaign around Jenny's character to a ludicrous degree. For example, myself and a number of our party members have noticed for a long time that no matter how much damage we may collectively deal as a party, no boss has ever died until she hits them. This is also something that is applied to the last enemy of any particular combat encounter. We'll collectively barrage the last bandit with rogue sneak attacks, hails of arrows, paladin smites, and anything else we have, but after literally hundreds of points of damage, the thing that bandit dies to is always Jenny's magic missile. I'm not usually one to get jealous over arbitrary kill counts in D&D, but some of us have actively started withholding our attacks to let her just hit the last enemy for them to miraculously die when Jenny hits them despite them not having been target yet and seeming perfectly fine in the last turn. This is far from the most overt thing though. Whenever Jenny is disappointed with the damage a magic missile does or that she misses an attack with a weapon, Mike will retcon the stats of the weapon to do more damage or have higher bonuses to hit to an insane degree. I can buy that you forgot to put a damage bonus or bonus to hit on a magic weapon you hand out, but when he's adding, no joke, as much as 6d6 extra damage onto a magic crossbow just to appease her when she's sad that she didn't one-shot an enemy, it gets absurd. Oh, that sword was supposed to be a plus five, that actually hits, or oh my bad, this random soldier is actually weak to lightning damage, so double that damage, and oh, I forgot to add the second damage type, add 4d12 fire damage onto that strike, it gets tiring very fast especially when it only happens for one character. Jenny is playing a full caster, yet she's better in martial combat than any of us martial characters because the random bonuses she keeps being miraculously given. Compounding the frustration is that we have spent the last several months only doing content related to Jenny's character backstory, dealing exclusively with her family of wacky and zany characters and exclusively helping them while ignoring the main plot. 
Any attempt to get back on track quickly sees Mike railroad us back to the realms of Jenny's past so that she can once again be the star of the show. In all honesty, I'm beginning to feel like an NPC played by a guest character rather than a player at all. I'm not sure what to do at this point. I don't really know how to talk to Mike about this and I don't want to hurt his feelings by pulling out of the campaign, but things have gotten so ridiculous that it feels like the only option. Am I crazy here or is this actually a problem? What do I even begin to do about this? You're not crazy, and if it was just the first few points, yeah, I would sort of get how the OP can misinterpret the DM's intentions, but after reading the entire story, I mean, it just gets worse and worse and worse. It's to the point where I have no idea how someone other than Jenny could have fun in this campaign. The thing that hits me the most is the railroading for Jenny's story. I'm all about telling the story of the group in a D&D campaign, focusing on every single party member. Yeah, sometimes people are going to take the spotlight, but that doesn't mean that everyone can't have a story of their own. Focusing on specifically one person the entire time and stopping anyone else from taking the spotlight, not good at all, especially when it's the DM responsible. If the OP is watching this, you need to talk to your DM. This is incredibly important. You need to be open with your feelings and admit to him how you feel about his campaign. And if he doesn't take the criticism and isn't willing to change, then the best thing you can do for both of you is to leave. So I've been GMing Call of Cthulhu for a while now, but I wanted to join a game as a player. I went looking on Roll20 and found a group advertising itself as quote unquote, old farts running a campaign about a boat trip to Alaska. I was a little wary, but I thought I would ask to join anyway. I was accepted and I spent the better part of two weeks prepping. I was told that one party member was an Alan Quartermain type and the other was a big game hunter, set in the 1920s but little else. So I thought I would roll something of a scholar to balance out the team. And as I rolled up the stats and thought about it, I decided I'd like to flavor that as a folk musician, picking up on lots of history and lore on the road. I thought this would work well joining in on an existing campaign heading into Alaska and got the okay on the concept. As I thought about the character, I decided I might like to play a woman, so I wrote her backstory as Peg Mark Jones, a 46-year-old woman who worked in agriculture when she was younger before hitting the road with her grandfather's fiddle. I played her as an androgynous, perhaps occasionally passing as a man while she was on the road for safety. This was all in my character sheet, which I sent to the GM, who okayed the character with the only comment being the suggestion that I start out with a few spells, uncommon for Call of Cthulhu characters. So I was actually really excited. The GM inputs all of my info into a Roll20 character sheet without my asking him to, expressing some exasperation that I hadn't done it myself within the next 24 hours, with the game itself still being a week off. First red flag. On top of that, he input a picture of his own choice, a pretty young blonde woman instead of the androgynous middle-aged woman I described. I told him I could go through edit and put in a pic of my own. I looked around and couldn't find any picture that perfectly fit my vision, but eventually found one that kind of captured the androgynous vibe. GM responds, saying essentially, This is a picture of a man smoking a pipe, not a woman with a fiddle. Fee fi fo fum, I smell an anachronism. That last part is verbatim, another red flag, but I simply explained that the picture isn't really one-to-one, -one, but that was the best I could manage to capture some of her look and vibe, as I genuinely find the picture able to pass male or female. This is where he suddenly shifts. He responds, saying that I'm pranking his players and that he wouldn't allow a male player to play a butch woman in drag from the 1920s. He suddenly, long after seeing and transferring my character sheet to Roll20, insists that I'm pulling a 21st century prank on the other players and it's a bunch of BS. At this point, I decide, fine, this is no longer a group I'm interested in playing with if we're going 0 to 60 criticizing roleplay decisions this quickly. I simply respond with a link to an article about the history of women who have disguised themselves as men for various reasons and the word, bye. I want to make a point about Butch Woman being more historically accurate than a fictional character like Alan Quartermain. That player just had a picture of Sean Connery from the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen as his pick, but decide to be more mature and just not argue. Later on, he apparently blocks me, leaving a new post in the forum seeking players saying that didn't work out how you thought it did, did it? Calling my character a bull dyke with a mohawk. 
The pic has messy hair, but not a mohawk, and my description said nothing about a mohawk anyway, and that I didn't follow the assignment, despite him improving my character concept every step of the way until I just changed the picture. So, this was my first shot at using Roll20's public searches to find a game, and likely, my last. Fortunately, I got the evidence of how awful this GM is before the session, but the rapid descent into personal attacks and queerphobia was really outstanding. Hopefully, I find a good game in person, but this was a pretty negative experience. We have talked about LFGs. I've gone on record defending LFGs and saying that they can be a source of a great game, but this, yeah, this is not supporting my case. Horror stories like this are absolutely possible, but this is the best outcome. There are crappy people out there, but the best you can do is exit their game before it even starts, which is what the OP did. Oh, the guy even managed to cite their sources before leaving, so that's a win for them. If someone is this hostile to a character choice such as this, it is an absolute sign that you need to leave. Going from 0 to 60, like the OP said, is a bad sign for the game to come, because who knows how they're going to act with player decisions in actual gameplay if this is how they react to just simple talking during a session 0. Not good at all, and good on the OP for getting out. Hey out there, Editing Crispy, I changed the story, surprise surprise, I know, but this one was for a good reason, it's because the original story had a bunch of random colors as the character names, so I switched it to be their classes. Anyway, onto the story. I want to preface this by apologizing for any format issues. This is my first post on here, and I'm still getting used to the style of it. I will also apologize for the length of the post. The people involved include the following. Myself, playing a wizard. DM, our DM slash my partner, playing husband NPC. Rogue, the attempted homewrecker, playing a rogue. A warlock, barbarian, and fighter. Three male players in our party. I joined my DM's campaign in college just in time for session 2. DM had started a homebrew campaign with Warlock, Barbarian, and Fighter. Everything was going great and I was thoroughly enjoying the campaign. About a month or so into the game though, Fighter lets DM know that Rogue wants to join up with our group. DM looks over her character sheet and background and gives Rogue a seal of approval. Now, I had seen Rogue around campus before. She was quiet and a little awkward during our first few sessions, but I chalked it up to her being inexperienced with roleplaying. As the campaign went on, our party became a genuine group of friends outside the game. It was nice to have people to talk to about nerdy stuff, and that was when the DM and I started to low-key flirt with one another. It was also around this time that Warlock came to me and told me that Rogue had asked him out. Warlock did not feel that way about Rogue though, so he ended up turning her down. A few weeks later, Barbarian said that Rogue had also tried to ask him out, but he turned her down as well. During this time, DM and I had started seeing each other romantically. Our university went on break, and when we returned, DM and I told the group that we were dating. Everything was perfect until our characters went on one mission. Before I describe the mission that led to the story, here's a little context. My character, a wizard, was married to an NPC who just happened to be the employer of Rogue's character. Rogue's character had known the NPC for years in-game, and the two retained a good friendship. Before this mission, the husband NPC asked Rogue's character to look out for my wizard, given that they were spouses. Anyway, on this particular mission, we needed to lure a target to a back alley to kill him. We all agreed that my wizard would use her charm to lure the target to the back alley. One thing or another goes wrong, so my wizard ends up kissing the target in order to keep him from getting suspicious. The mission ended up being a success, and we ended the mission there. It was then that Rogue said her rogue was angry, and that my wizard had cheated on the husband NPC. Even though my wizard had only kissed the target to save the rest of the party, nothing more was really said, and we ended it there. DM pulled me aside shortly after the session and told me he had gotten a message from Rogue saying her Rogue was going to tell the husband NPC that my wizard was a cheater and that he should divorce her, which would mean death for my wizard due to a soul bonding ritual that brought my character back to life earlier in the campaign. Damn, I know it's till death do us part, but that is... Whew. Anyway, I was flabbergasted to say the least. DM had shown me a message from Rogue saying that her Rogue had a crush on the husband NPC after all of the years they worked together. I thought this might be a cool little RP thing in-game to give our characters some depth and growth and party drama. I thought it was going to be fun until another hangout out of game. 
During this hangout, we played Paranoia. It's a game where someone asks the person next to them a question, which the answer must be someone in the group. The whole group will know the name that is said, but not the question that is asked. A coin is flipped, and if it lands heads up, the question is repeated out loud. If the coin lands tails up, nobody knows the question except the two players. DM, Warlock, Barbarian, Rogue, a few other people I knew, and myself were playing this game in our dorm. Rogue gets a question, giggles to herself a little, and then says, DM. The coin is flipped, and it lands heads up. The question, who do you think is best at sex? I was livid. She could have said any number of the single people there, but she had to say the name of my partner. Afterwards, DM told me how uncomfortable he was that Rogue had said that, but this was not the end for our dear Rogue. A few days before the next session, DM came to me absolutely fuming. I asked him what the problem was, and he handed me his phone. On it were a bunch of low-key flirty messages sent from Rogue. That was the final straw for the both of us. At the next session, Rogue's Rogue told the husband NPC about my wizard's infidelity, to which the husband NPC responded with anger to Rogue's character. He berated her, saying that she was to look after the wizard, not to tattletale about the wizard. He then asked what she thought was going to happen, to which the rogue replied, she thought he would want to divorce her and find someone more loyal. Husband NPC reminded the rogue that doing so would kill the wizard, and that she didn't actually cheat. He ended up firing this rogue for her insubordination with the promise that she could come back when she learned to keep her nose in her own business. That last part might have been a little meta on DM's part, but no one else really seemed to mind, even after they were told about everything that went down. We still have Rogue in our party, but she hasn't tried making any moves on anyone else. I am also happy to say that DM and I are currently engaged and very happy with one another. TLDR, a player tries to get with my partner both in and out of game with no success. I will never understand why people think this works. You're looking at somebody in a stable, happy relationship as far as you know, and you think that they're going to drop everything to get with you a person that they barely know, or know at least a lot less than their partner. That makes no sense to me, even logistically. That's just complete nonsense. But I guess some people just think it's going to work out. It's especially confusing when D&D &D is the avenue by which this homewrecker attempts to homewreck. This is a great example of completely out of game drama that definitely affects the game itself. A lot of people think that you can leave drama at the door when playing D&D. &D. You can completely cut it out. That is ridiculous and impossible. You are a group of people playing this game. People problems are going to affect it. You just need to handle it like mature adults in order to make sure that your group stays together. Something Rogue will hopefully be able to do in the future of this game. I started frequenting my local game store around spring of 2021 just as COVID mandates were letting up in my state. The store had apparently sprouted in my local mall sometime right before or after <laughs> Couldn't notice because, well, I was inside. This place hosted mostly MTG and Yu-Gi-Oh games, both of which I know nothing about, but there were a few people who worked there that I would talk to for an hour or so after I finished browsing, so I spent a decent amount of my time after work there. One of these times, sometime in May, I hear two guys loitering, discussing potentially starting up a D&D campaign over the summer, hosted in the store. I apologized for eavesdropping, but asked if I could get in on it, and they seemed cool, as they didn't mind, and happily invited me into the conversation and introduced themselves. Now, the cast. All fake names, of course, except my own present in this conversation. Myself, Maya. Player 1 is Andrew. Player 2 is a cool guy named Ethan. Player 3 is Don and the creepy DM Joe, both introduced later on. It had been a good amount of time since I'd actually played D&D in person, as well my high school shut down in 2020 during my senior year, and I hadn't meaningfully been outside since, go figure. So I was really excited to play with an IRL group again. We discussed the general information of their hopes for meetings, times, and dates and such, and the DM that Andrew intended to have run the campaign. This whole conversation probably lasted all of 10 minutes before we went and talked to an employee, who fetched the manager who promised to talk to the owner, but said the time slot we wanted, Wednesday evenings, would probably go over fine with him. 
We have a session zero at Andrew's place, a few days before our first session at the store, and everything goes swimmingly. I'm introduced to Don, who is about 15 to 20 years older than all of us, but he was a nice guy who fit with the group well. We take about two and a half hours creating character sheets and then fleshing out our characters, backstories, flaws, ideals, bonds, you know the drill. We all wanted to do this together as Andrew said that in the games he had played previously with this DM, he encouraged backstory overlap between PCs and his NPCs. Not that it matters, but I was playing a tiefling bard, Andrew was a human barbarian, Ethan was an elf cleric, and Don was a tabaxi monk. The session has been going on for about three hours at this point, most of us are getting tired or having homework as all of us but Don were college students, so we ended it there. I get home and my roommate is still awake and I am giving absolute rave reviews of the session. She was very entertained, specifically by the dynamic between my character and Ethan's character, which I rambled excessively about. My character was named Leo Fritsch and had previously known Ethan's character Ganymede and they complimented each other ironically. I was meant to be rather meek and nervous bard while he was the noxious flamboyant cleric. This information is actually relevant for context. Anyways, Wednesday comes and the way it worked out is that Ethan is the one who would come pick me up, as I live not five minutes out of the way on his route to the local game store. We arrived, and the only other person there is the DM, Joe. Mind you, the only person who had met Joe before is Andrew. He's only shown us pictures of them together before, as they've apparently been friends for years. So Ethan and I introduce ourselves to him. Joe acts, and the only way I can describe this is, like he has never met a woman before. Before even acknowledging my existence, he incredulously asks Ethan if he has brought his chick. I am, and I think understandably, mortified and pissed. Not that it matters, but I had a girlfriend at the time. Didn't think that was necessary to mention though, and I definitely did not want to now. Before I think of anything to say, Ethan tells him that I'm just his friend, and Joe then asks if that means I'm, and I'm not even kidding, free game. He has still yet to address me directly. I have never once met a person who acted like this and in turn have no idea how to respond. I no doubt look viscerally uncomfortable at this point, but I am too shocked and embarrassed to verbally express how angry I am. Ethan loudly introduces me again to Joe, saying something to the tune of, this is Maya and she is right there if you want to say anything. Joe shrugs it off, gives me a hi, and then pretends I don't exist for the next like 10 minutes. The other guys arrive and Andrew introduces Don to Joe who has now seemingly gained the ability to meet someone and actually acts like a normal human being? Against my better judgment, thinking Ethan could hold things down, I stay for the session. I unfortunately am the type of person to order a 12 ounce rare steak, receive a well done 6 ounce, thank the waiter, and then tip 25%. I was also pretty desperate to play an actual in-person game at this point as it had been more than a year, so I decided it was worth it to just put up with this. Not my best decision ever, I wish Ethan would have offered to take me home, but bygones. We start the session and the theme Joe established earlier clearly holds up as we get in character. Despite the fact that my character was male, Joe immediately has his male bartender NPC hit on him, complimenting his great figure. Ethan asks the NPC directly in character if he can tell if our friend at the table here is a man, and Joe's NPC says something or other about he had a thing for pretty boys. Barf. Joe kept this up for the entire session. Anytime an NPC needs to interact with our group, the only person addressed is myself. There's a whole cast of creeps for us to interact with. The creepy gnome shopkeep who gives a discount to the gorgeous little bard. The creepy human patriarch of the house who is more interested in begging a male tiefling than the mission he's sending us on to save his kids. The creepy resident town wizard who despite being described as a human in his 70s says he would have the stamina to keep up with a vivacious young man. Oh, the goblins we fight who never attempt to attack me on their turn and then openly state they'll just kill the men but the tiefling is coming with them and more. While I tend to be a rather unconfrontational person outside of LARPing and my bard was planned to be a shy little guy, having an outlet through which I can express myself indirectly most definitely emboldens me to say exactly what I think. Give a man a mask so it's very easy to make it more than clear every single time that my character is completely uninterested in every single advance made on him and yet Joe still refuses to take the hint and apparently thinks I'm into him and playing hard to get or something. 
I tell the bartender that it sucks that I'm not into big, dumb half-orcs who hit on their patrons. I tell the shopkeep directly to bugger off and keep his eyes to himself lest he loses his whole party's business. I tell the head of the house that he should make it clear that he is faithful to his wife and family or will reconsider helping him find his kids entirely, because if he doesn't care, why would we? I call the wizard an old fart and tell him he has a shriveled up old man cock, which gets a laugh out of Ethan, but gets Joe all huffy and red in the face, which I think prompted him to have our first battle end in my kidnapping. I can tell that Andrew, Ethan, and Don are all getting fed up with Joe paying my character exclusive attention, but Don seems to have thought that it was my fault that my character was getting smothered by the NPCs, despite my character openly reacting negatively. He starts taking it out on me by shunning my character from conversations, refusing to address me, ignoring my existence when I try to weigh in on decisions about what the party should do next. Real mature for a man that has about two decades on everyone in the room. Ethan, and to a lesser extent, Andrew, try to rope me in, but Don shuts them down every time by talking over them and turning down their propositions too. Now Joe's getting pissy with Don on top of trying to harass me, and his NPCs begin insulting Don's character while they call me beautiful and gorgeous and fertile, amongst other things. Once the goblins threaten to kidnap my character, however, I just lost it. We only get about an hour into the session before I push myself back from the table, stand up, and get into this DM's face. I'm raging, and I have lost every crap to give. I very sternly but calmly tell him that he's ruining the game for all his players by trying to bang my male character, and that he can just take his creepy, misogynistic self-insert NPCs and shove them up his ass so far that they just might fit in his head. TLDR, I was excited to play my first in-person D&D game since COVID, but when I arrived at the session, the DM asked the only player I was with if I was his chick, or free game. I was pissed, but stayed anyway because said player stood up for me and I really wanted to play. The DM then spent the entire session harassing my character through NPCs trying to hit on him. Everyone was fed up with this, but one player started taking it out on me. The DM got pissed at this player and began raging at that player's character through his NPCs while flirting with my character. The game ends when I told off the DM and got out of there while the enemies we were battling said they were going to kidnap my character. I learned after that he called me a who couldn't take a joke and thought everything was and naturally bonded with the player that was mad at me over that. Now I avoid the local game store I used to frequent in hopes I never have to see them again. Is this the worst one? Probably not. We have seen some stuff on this channel, but it is up there in the list. This one is pretty bad. I have no idea what the thought process is here. People who are dehumanized and ignored typically don't fall in love, or at least that's my understanding. Seriously, are the Alos okay? Blink if you are. Please let me know in some way. My concern is growing the more I read these stories. It really sucks too. Local game stores get a lot of crap in these stories. I know a lot of them can be fun, but yeah, at their worst, they can be really, really rough. In some ways, local game stores almost act like the internet. A lot of barriers break down in them for some reason that are usually present in real life games. I think local game stores though, overall, are good. It's just stories like this that taint the fun of them, and I think that that really, really sucks. And that is everything that I have for you guys today. If you guys enjoyed this episode of RPG Horror Stories and you want to let me know, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then you can check out our Campaign Diary series where I go over the story of my D&D campaign right there in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content right as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down into the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment creep campaign to let me know you made it to the end of the video. Nessence like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.